Do you ever see a successful woman on your feed or in a magazine and think, wow, it must be nice to have it so easy? Well, think again. Behind that glossy cover or smiling face is a ton of hard work, countless failures, and endless learning experiences. I'm Rebecca Minkoff, and I'm here to tell you that success isn't a walk in the park. It takes grit, resilience, and a willingness to take risks. That's why I created Superwoman, a podcast that peels back the varnish and gets into the nitty gritty of what it takes to make it as a woman in today's world. From luminaries and game changers to women you've never heard of but should, this podcast is here to inspire you to take your next leap, no matter how daunting it may seem. We'll explore the sacrifices these women have made, the highs and lows they've experienced, and the lessons they've learned along the way. So if you're ready to be inspired and learn from some of the most successful women out there, Join me on Superwomen. Together, we'll uncover the stories behind the successes and prove that with hard work, determination, and a little bit of luck, anything is possible. Hey, everyone. You're listening to Superwomen. Today's guest is Danielle cohen Shohet, the founder of Gloss Genius. You don't always get to meet these highly technical, skilled engineering type founders that go on to create massively huge companies that... Just to me as an area, I feel like I'm not the smartest in. Just blow me away with the ultra complicated world of technology, the payments providing solution end of it. But Danielle did just that. She started this company fresh, almost after the heels of a job with an incredible background. I'm going to leave this one a mystery to you. You need to listen to this because her story is incredible. Her journey is incredible. And what she's built is awesome. Take a listen. Danielle, welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited to talk to you today. Me too. So let's go back. Um, What were you doing before you launched and founded Gloss Genius? I was working in finance at Goldman Sachs. And there were a few areas of interest that had always kind of occupied my mind, but I was full-time focused on my role in finance at Goldman. And what made you go, let me leave this cushy job, which is very hard, by the way, cushy when I say benefits, you know, the fact that it's stable, you know, you're probably making good money and be like, let's go start a business and see what happens. What kind of take me through that sort of mindset? Sure. I think one of the most important things that I really wanted from the role I had and I wasn't really feeling it was just hands-on impact. I love building things. I love being able to solve problems for real people. And the work I was doing at Goldman was great and I was learning a lot, but at a certain point in time, I felt a little bit disconnected from some of the people um, whose problems I was actually solving. And given I had had a lot of background and interest in a few different areas that have like elegantly come to um, the expression that Gloss Genius is, I kept kind of coming back to it and realizing like I just wanted to pursue this that I was really interested in. I was, um, you know, kind of drawn to the beauty industry, had experience there. My twin sister and I had started a digital receipts point of sale company back in college. So we were both very interested in the point of sale payment space. Um, you know, I, I pursued studying small businesses with some liberalization reforms, uh, during call. And there's just a lot of things that kind of came together um, in addition to technical background I had that um, led me to, you know, found Gloss Genius. And I, I think it was the idea that I could do something that was really impactful and hands-on and solving a real problem for real people that really actually got me going on it. So starting anything in the tech space is extraordinarily difficult. It's capital intense. So how did you begin basically to fund that and or develop that? Did you did you raise right away or t- talk me through that? No, we didn't actually. I think one of the best skills that I brought at the time was just an ability to look at anything that I needed to be able to do and realize that most of the costs when it comes to starting a startup would be going to headcount or building a team. And I found ways to just do it myself. And I think the reason why this was really valuable was not only it Uh, was a way that I could kind of effectively start the company in a very lean way. Uh, It also was a way for me to drive a fast amount of progress um, in a pretty short period of time because I was basically kind of overseeing a lot of things and I knew which dials to turn and things to push on. And the third thing now, looking at where we are, I think it has been a great advantage for me to have had deep experience building certain parts of of the functions across company right now because I basically see how 
things work. Um, I got a firsthand experience at that. And I think I'm a better operator uh, today because of that. I love that you say that because I feel like you're probably the only person I know that decided to have a tech platform and and company that didn't go like, oh, I got to go raise 50 million or 25 million because it's so expensive. You know, we bootstrapped and what we learned by bootstrapping was so valuable, you know, versus getting handed some cash and then figuring it out. So I'm just, I'm just excited that you did that. So what were some of the key learnings you felt really made a difference in you understanding the business? And then when you, did you raise money? I'm assuming at some point. You did. Yes. So then tell me how that informed your raising of the funds and then how you used it differently than maybe some others would. Yeah. One of the most important learnings we had early on was like everything that we were working on just had to matter. And we had to show customer value really quickly because we couldn't go on for a long time working on things that customers weren't finding valuable and wouldn't be able to be used to reinvest back into more and more development and things that would ultimately drive even more value for them. So just being maniacal about focusing on customer value early on and taking out a lot of the frills that many startups kind of have and pursue right now and being laser focused on the things that really mattered was one of the most important learnings. And I think it was extremely helpful when we actually came time, when it, when it came time to raise uh, capital, because we had had a, a fundamental understanding of our customers, our market, the opportunity, and real traction and progress to be able to show what exactly we were going to use capital for to take this to the next level. And I think it helped us be a lot more careful about how we were using capital and thoughtful when it came time to using capital that would directly benefit customers as they were basically being continually reinvested back into it faster and higher um, paces. So before we go further into the podcast, I obviously know what Gloss Genius is, but for those listening, can you just give a quick elevator pitch of what, what is the product that you built? Sure. So Gloss Genius is, in a shorthanded way, what I would describe as a vertical software payments company for small businesses. We focus on serving small businesses across the beauty and wellness space. And what we actually do is, if you think about the suite of solutions that we have into one single platform, we help business owners like spa owners, salon owners, um, other types of small business owners across, as I mentioned, the beauty and wellness space, run better businesses. And we do that through offering things like booking, scheduling, payments, um, client relationship management, marketing solutions, team management solutions, all in one single platform. So business owners can be better business owners and do the things they really love. So that's what we do. It, and uh, that takes me to what I had shared at a higher level, which is a vertical software payments company for the beauty wellness industry. So take me through what you found that you thought was going to be helpful for your customers because because you know i'll go like oh this is the best bag ever and then no one likes it until years later when it's no longer in stock and i wear it and people are like oh i like that bag i'm like hey asshole you could have bought it you know two years ago <laughs> um so what is something that you learned that you thought would be you know an mvp for your customer that then wasn't as you were building it let me start with what we learned how we learned it and then i'll share a little bit about what we learned also that would not have been as helpful in so doing. So one of the things that we learned was running a small business is really hard. There's oftentimes a single owner operator who's maybe just getting started or who's trying to scale a operation and, and kind of take their dream somewhere bigger and farther. And yet they're basically having to do so many different jobs. Uh, it's like the role of a founder, an entrepreneur. They're having to manage uh, the craft, the service, clients, uh, marketing, the back office, finance, the budget, um, all these other things that I think right now we take for granted in a much larger company that are done by different departments and functions are done singularly by maybe one or two folks at a very small company. And so what that gets me to is this problem, which is um, you know, at the highest level that running a small business is extremely hard and scaling one is even harder because you're caught doing things that are uh, meant to service businesses day to day. But that basically means you have very little time to focus on things in the future and growth opportunities. And when you kind of start there, it had a lot of background in the beauty industry. I had done a lot of um, freelancing, loved makeup artistry. And so I had some 
kind of working knowledge of a lot of the problems firsthand that basically helped me be super pointed to go deeper with a true understanding of where uh, business owners were spending a lot of time. And what I did with that was spend a lot of time figuring out workflow. Where are people spending the most time? What is super painful for them? Um, and you know, kind of putting our our product aside, just really understanding how people are like operating day to day and whether there's software there or not, um, what is occupying their headspace and what is keeping them from being a successful business owner was one of the most important questions that I just had on my dashboard day in and day out. And I spent um, every single minute of, of every single day um, in the early days and even now uh, thinking about. And what I realized was there's basically just a lot of things that businesses have to do and bringing them all together into a system that just in the words of business owners talks, you know, to different parts of the system um, was, was a big opportunity, a big pain point. And basically having data that would flow from clients that were booking you, landing on the schedule to then understand who of those clients were very valuable, what types of tickets or um, checkouts should have been in queue, but weren't. How does staff understand how to bring clients back in? Who should you be marketing to? How should you be marketing to them? This entire system of record was completely broken for uh, businesses, and it was costing them a lot of time and keeping them back from revenue potential for, for their business and ultimately succeeding as a small business owner. So that was one thing that I noticed right away um, in just studying and studying and studying workflow and talking to customers and you know, kind of getting things out incrementally, shipping them, learning super fast from them that I very quickly started to validate. And that helped me kind of basically come to, you know, where we are today. But in so doing, I quickly learned other things that were not as valuable, um, that there were small tests we did to kind of prove our hypothesis. And we quickly saw that there's, um, some ways we wanted to solve problems of like helping business owners get more revenue by, uh, like lead generation, for example. And what we realized was that wasn't really helpful because lead generation would only go so far for businesses uh, that ultimately wouldn't be able to bring customers back or understand them or market efficiently back to them. And so it was kind of like you're solving a problem in one part of the funnel, but not one that can span many layers down. And that's a good example of something that we you know, kind of quickly tested and came to this hypothesis it was proven very on that there was a much more important lasting opportunity to impact how people were succeeding as small business owners rather than just kind of give them all the answers. Um, and so that was a exciting learning because I think it has now propagated a lot of the ways that the product has evolved with our own product philosophies. For example, one of the product philosophies we have is like a deep focus on the infrastructure and tooling that enables success for business owners in our industry, rather than just kind of like telling them exactly what they should be doing, um, because every business is different. And we'd rather provide the infrastructure and the tools for them to succeed rather than just have a one size fits all approach um, that may not be lasting for their own success. Wow. So you've had to, <clears throat> I mean, I think anyone who's worked in finance probably has a, a great um, just stability, I've noticed, of great stability with building a business, forecasting, budgets, all, all that stuff. Um, but essentially, you've built this business from zero to very, very high revenues. What have you learned the most about yourself in this process? And and have you ever had those moments where you're like, can I still be the CEO? Do I know what I'm doing? Yeah. Well, every day is a um, exercise of reflection and personal growth development and learning about yourself is essential. But one of the things I've learned the most about myself is that, and I think this is true for a lot of people, my uh, strengths are another side of my weaknesses at the same time. And let me unpack this. You know, I mentioned a bit ago that one of my strengths is that I've built all different parts of the uh, company and I have pretty deep operating experience. And I could look at that and anyone could look at that and think that's a strength too. But I think that also is in some way another side of um, what could be viewed as a potential weakness as a CEO, where uh, you know I may have a tendency to understand exactly how things should operate or look 
and I may have a particular point of view, or I may feel like I could solve the problem myself instead of relying on someone else. And so I think that's been a really important learning. It took me a bit to to really understand that about myself, particularly as the organization evolved. But I think now with the great evolution we've had, I can see it much clearer than I've ever been able to see it. Uh, the second thing I learned about myself, and I think this is something that a lot of uh, founders end up learning, is just the importance of listening to yourself and being very uncompromising with some of the standards that you have or that you desire in your business or levels of of kind of excellence that you think are appropriate and should be there to actually get something done and write out to customers. And everyone may have a different point of view, but the point of view that you hold is extremely important. And over time, as I've gotten more and more comfortable understanding my own point of view and why it should matter and sharing that with other people, one of the most important learnings has come from that is listening to myself around certain standards and um, around a certain point of view I have for customers and the vision of the product that uh, sometimes is is hard to to stay disciplined alongside of, but I think has been a meaningful learning for me and one that I'm excited to just keep harnessing for whatever's next. Do you have an example of a time where you didn't listen and what was the outcome that taught you like from I had my moment where I was like, I didn't listen. We hired a bad egg. It like rotted the whole place. And I knew in my gut it was wrong, but I kept questioning my own self and saying, I don't know enough. I'm no good. And so I let it happen. Um, and after that, I was like, never again. Do you have did you have that moment? Definitely. I mean, there are examples with hires, for example, that we made as, as uh, you point out. But one other example, too, that came up, we were, you know, focusing on working something on the roadmap. I didn't really agree. I didn't think it was moving at the right pace or we were basically designing it around the same type of standards that I would have imagined. And we got to the end of kind of working on it. And I had reflected and said, this is not how I would have started building it. And I would have probably started in a different way. And I think being able to understand that was important to me because it also was an opportunity for me to realize where I'd left context out for folks. Right. So like that was another important learning for me. It was, it was not necessarily on someone else, but it was on me to bring that back to them. And I think that's just one example, but throughout all of this, I've realized that there's probably better ways that I can also bring folks in and understand more and more context is in my mind that will also help more people in some way, kind of like listen to the thoughts in my mind that I care strongly about the organization um, pursuing and everyone can be much more aligned. And so, yeah, it, it was kind of a long way to way to describe a certain example, but I, I think it, um, comes up all the time. And it also is always a good opportunity for me to become a much better CEO and listener too. With the type of business you're in, you can have eventually an acquisition that's billions of dollars as many other you know companies that I've seen have, um, but you're also really dependent on the economy and people, right? And, and the businesses that you're serving. So have you had to weather any bad economic storms and sort of what did you do to stick around through that? Yeah, the macro always matters. And in our industry, and even in others, there's always going to be at some scale, a very important, um, you know, kind of way to bring the macro in and and have it nav- and have it, you know, kind of force you to navigate things in a different way, if if it's relevant. One of the most important experiences we had was during COVID. I think everyone has some experience. I wasn't going to ask the COVID story, but I knew you probably had trouble in COVID. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, imagine this. There's customers whose success determines our own success. And there was so much uncertainty in the early part of COVID. And now with the benefit of hindsight, it some of the decisions that we all made as a country seem like they went on for too long, or maybe we didn't have to do shutdowns in the way we did. But at the time, there was just a lack of information, a whole bunch of uncertainty. And when you look at 
our industry and small business owners that were forced shut, some of them forced shut for months at a time, they had no access to livelihoods that they were normally dependent on. And it was an extremely difficult time for us because there were certain forces out of our control, things we didn't understand, data of the business that was changing every single day. So even when you had a plan to react to something, you had to come up with a new plan tomorrow and the next day after. And yet you still kind of had to maintain this central mission of uh, making others successful, which is something that is, you know, kind of what we care a lot about and why customers come and use our product. They come and use our product so they can be more successful. And so it was super tough because, as I mentioned, data was changing all the time. Um, you know, it was a lot of uncertainty that made it hard to plan in a normally uncertain you know, environment, which is the startup life. Uh, so it was multiplied. But I think one of the most important learnings from this is just kind of like staying true to uh, certain principles of decision making and the mission you have. One of the mission, you know, one of the most important principles of decision making we had is like, what can we do, and how can we make a decision that will be so intensely aligned with our customers that they will succeed, and as a result of them succeeding, we as a company also will have no other choice but to succeed alongside our own customer success. And so, just flexing on that area of decision making and stuff that had always been true to the company and, and deep in our DNA, and and using a super challenging time to bring a lot more of that out was was really critical. It was uh, scary and not obvious at certain times, but that helped us redesign the whole entire roadmap, you know, be super agile. Things that we thought would have taken us months at a time to do, we were now doing and shipping in just a few weeks, um, days even. And it was just incredibly energizing period of time where the entire team was galvanized around just making our customers successful, which is what we should be galvanized around every single day normally. Um, but it was a forcing function to just get down to the essence of all of that. So it was super difficult. And I would say one of those periods of time where you learn years and years of leadership lessons in just a few weeks. And I I'm grateful for it um, because I think it's made us much stronger as a company, a team, and uh, for myself too, as a CEO. What is one of those leadership lessons you feel like would be helpful to other leaders? Intense focus on the things that really matter and clarity for the entire team on what that is. Yep. And during COVID, it was made very clear that our customer success is our success. And the team already kind of knew that, but just making it extra clear and using this as a principle of decision making and just talking about this now so many more times in all these meetings around how will this make customers more successful became the common fabric and currency across the organization that I think is something a lot of organizations lose sight of day to day. People start working on their own things over here. And suddenly, before you know it, as the organization grows, there's you know kind of a, a lot of different teams who are all fighting for themselves instead of one common central mission. And... I think it's a really important leadership lesson that at every stage matters, but particularly as companies get even larger, matters so much more. I love that. I love that, you know, I, I echo what you said. We we took something that was going to take us five years to pivot in during COVID and we had a month, you know? So I think as hard as it was, it allowed certain changes to occur because you had no choice. Survival was forcing you to focus on what matters for sure. That's right. And prove value. And I think you could look at that snippet of experience and then apply it to a lot of other areas, starting a startup even, where at certain stages, survival is the question. So how do you use that to now think about what you should be doing differently uh, when, when it comes to different phases you're navigating of the startup journey? So fortunately, we, we uh, you know, had a really great set of learnings and opportunities to really flex in places that mattered for customers as a highly you know, mission aligned company. And I'm excited that, that uh, the team also got a firsthand look at that. Yeah. And with the benefit of hindsight and reflection, I, I mean, I wish I would even learned that earlier. <laughs> yeah. How big is your team? Close to 300 people now. Wow. 
Yeah. How is your leadership style different from 300 to 30? I, I for, I'll never forget when I stopped remembering everybody's name and it bothered me greatly. We, at one point we had like 100 employees and I was like, this is impossible. Like I, I can't. Hello. Nice to see you. I recognize your face, but like, fuck, I don't remember your name. Yeah. But I like tapped out at like 60 or 75 is what my RAM could handle. So yeah. like, what's that been like for you to go from small and nimble to like over 300? It's been a fun journey. And I always try to stay in the details and really understand how things are working, uh, where they are, where we're going, and use my operating experience as a way to help teams at certain stages. One of the things that's changed the most is possibly uh, having to need having to fly at different altitudes. And that's really how I describe it. In the early days, there were things that I was super, super hands-on with myself building. Uh, and now I think I'm building a different part of the system where it might not necessarily be, you know, the spreadsheet and the inputs there, but there's another part of this that I'm helping others connect back to this broader system that we can think about on a much bigger scale. So altitude is one very important way that uh, my role has changed. And I think with that scope, um, another thing is just context. Whereas the team was super small, all the context was shared among a few uh, folks, myself included. And what I realized was that you have to basically change how you're giving context to folks. And it might not even be one-on-one, -on -one, but maybe there's more context you need to start doing on a one-to-many basis. So now you can empower many more people to understand the things you understand and to see the things you do. So how context is provided has been uh, in a big evolution and is still an ongoing work in progress too. And then I think another place as well is like defining certain principles has become more and more important. There are so many things in the early days that were rather informal. Culture, for example, mm -hmm. was something that was just informally developed by the people you hired, the things that they were doing, what you expected of the team, how things got out to market, um, who you were promoting, et cetera. But now the importance of defining more and more of those upfront is important. And so it's kind of moved a little bit away from a informal definition of, of sorts to much more of a formal one that everyone can use and be on the same page with. So they're empowered to understand the things that, that we see and take things to the next level, even without us in the room. So I've noticed as we're talking that when you are answering questions, you have a smile and a satisfaction. And I'm wondering how you've had that mindset to stay so positive and you seem excited, you know, and I meet a lot of CEOs that are obviously excited about what they're building, but they're like, oh my God, this is hard as fuck. So I'm just wondering, like, where do you get that energy from or what, what about it fuels you? There's so many places I get energy from today, but I would say, and by the way, there's ups and downs every single day. But I think it's about the trend line. And one of the places I get energy from is the team, obviously. I don't think there's any better feeling than working with someone who I find extremely bright and who understands a problem so deeply and is thinking about ideas and solutions in a much deeper, better way than even I am doing at this moment in time, which is extremely energizing to me. And whenever I see this occurring, it gives me so much energy. And I, I'm not even sure folks on the team realize how much energy it gives me. Maybe I should tell them, but um, that is another source. I think another source, you know, from the very beginning too, has just been impact driving on customers. The customers we're serving, they're real people. They're running real businesses. They're part of a real world around us. It's palpable. They're brick and mortar businesses that all of us have walked into at some point in time in our lives and, and um, will frequent. And, and they're people that we know. And, being able to firsthand see the impact we're having on customers and the fact that our customers will bring this back to the company and share it with us. So when we work on new functionality and, and get things like features out that can help customers be better business owners, they're not shy. They'll tell us how exciting um, some of it is. And they also will not be shy around telling us how much better it can be. And I think getting the truth from customers is something that excites me. And sometimes the truth is overwhelmingly positive with impact. And other times the truth is um, something that can lead us to a place where we will have overwhelmingly positive impact if we just listen and learn from it. So 
all those things I think are, are really positive and being able to see real impact is, is also very exciting. And the short feedback loop we have with customers has, has definitely been something that I've loved. You know, I was talking with a friend the other day and, and uh, we were talking about different industries and she had asked about different industries I would have gone into. And one of the things I mentioned was, you know, I've realized one of the ways I'm wired is that I love seeing things quicker and I'm impatient and I have a whole bunch of urgency and there's opportunities and problems to solve for much larger companies that maybe have a much longer sales cycle. Some of the enterprise sales cycles may take over a year. And my reflection was, being able to, um, you know, kind of be patient enough to wait over a year to see impact you're having or development in an account could actually not be that satisfying. And so I think the fact that we're getting quicker, um, you know, kind of show of impact we have given the type of cycle of customer development and acquisition has been something that I, I really value about the business and and the type of customers and industry we serve. And then other places I get energy from is just learning. Uh, and I think style comes from study. And over time, I've deepened more and more of, you know, kind of my style of how things are built. And I don't think that was something that was as clearly defined early on, but I've just continually been learning and studying about the craft. And that excites me because I feel like no day is the same. And I'm effectively getting to learn things that um, I can kind of turn the dial on and and control how deep I really want to go. So I find that very energizing because it has made me just a much better person and a much more well-rounded CEO. What do you do to detach and, and get away? I mean, it's hard to detach. Like the things that I'm doing, I love, and they're on my mind all the time. And I think that's also by choice. Uh, I want them to be on my mind because I care about them a lot and I'm excited uh, about them genuinely. So that said, things that I do try to do to detach, I love working out. I love exercising. I love reading. I love listening to podcasts. Uh, I love learning new things. Sometimes I feel like I don't have enough time to learn about different areas of study that would potentially be energizing and exciting to me. So if I had more time, maybe there'd be, you know, a whole bunch more uh, of the time I'd spend doing that. And yeah, I mean, in, in the spare, little spare time I have, I, I'd say it pretty much is contained to those things. I get it. You're, you're still in the insanity of building and growing. And so I, yeah. I feel you. Um, so my last question for you, because I already asked your advice question, which I thought was great, is what would we be surprised to know about you? Probably think something that would be surprising on the surface, but once you unpack a lot of the ways I spend time, the company or on certain initiatives or the things I really care about there, uh, I love design. And I, um, from the very, you know, kind of young, of young age, I was painting and drawing things. And so maybe in another life, I would have been a painter or artist. Um, there was a period of time where I had wanted to be an architect because I love designing and building things. So fast forward now, and and I'm kind of in some way like, the architect of impact that we get to have on customers and, and businesses that use our platform and products. So I find that extremely exciting. And a lot of the things that I spend time on and get also energy from would be teams that are building things that look a certain way, uh, certain designs, brand building aspects of what it is we're doing and, and who, how are customers going to hear about it. So that would be a fun fact and maybe somewhat surprising how much I actually care about that stuff. I love it. Well, hopefully in your future, there's lots of homes to design <laughs> and be the yeah. architect for. <laughs> yeah, we'll see in uh, some hopeful spare time that uh, I'll, I'll wait and watch out for. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Yeah, thank you for coming on. And it was great to connect. And uh, you, you built something beyond incredible. So I'm sure I'm sure you know how awesome that is. But good job. Thank you. No, no easy feat. Likewise. Back at you. Oh, thanks. I just wanted to thank you guys for listening to today's episode. I also want to ask you to rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts. I know it's a pain in the butt, but it actually helps with search and algorithm. So if you love this podcast, it is an easy way to get it more visible and out there. 
I also want you to follow me on Instagram at Rebecca Minkoff at RM Superwomen and be sure to check out my book, Fearless, The New Rules for Unlocking Creativity, Courage, and Success. Thank you again and you will hear from me next week.